Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of the Detour Live. It's going to be a cracking show. We've got some fantastic guests and we're going to be obviously recapping an epic uh, Paris-Roubaix on the weekend. We knew it was going to be epic given the weather and it didn't disappoint. Uh, I'm joined as always by four-time national road champion Johnny Chiro, the voice of cycling Phil Liggett and freshly retired cyclist Mitch Docker. Who's looking forward to the next chapter of his life, Mitch? Uh, how are you traveling, mate? Well, I'm okay now, or I'd say I'm about ninety percent. But I don't know whether it's a combination of slightly getting sick, the relief of the race, the relief of career, racing a wet Roubaix, everything combined. I was man down for a couple of days, and I mean proper. I've been like that for a long time, in the bed sick i was like what's going on here i think the body just finally let go Hmm. everything caught up on me and that was it i was i was sick so i'm sort of just recovering from that and i'm feeling a little bit better now and i'm ready maybe to have a few cleansing ales i always i always found at the end of a (laughs) three-week iffy tour around france you know when you release the stress and you get home you don't have to worry about it and all the toxins from those three it just you just fall fall in a heap. Like when you've been in such a full-on environment for so long, do you think part of it's physical, but there is a part of it that could be mental? I think it was a combination, yeah. I think I did actually get sick after the recon. I sort of kept it a little bit in the house because I was like, geez, the last thing I want to do now is get pulled because I've got a little bit of cough or something. Mm. Um, so I sort of managed it pretty well. But I think once, like exactly what you said, once I just came back and – relax and let myself relax and the build-up to my Roubaix was a bit of a stressful one anyway you know having the broken arm being the last race all this extra stress around a pretty stressful Roubaix I think all that rolled into one when I finally got home um yeah that was it I was I was in trouble well we obviously want to sorry Phil no I said you set the trend for the day I must say Mitch the first shot we saw you you were getting back on your bike uh, no, so, oh, there's a shot of it. I, I mean, of course, Bob Rowe, I was working with Bob Rowe on NBC and uh, Peacock TV is our new home. And uh, and he uh, he was pretty eloquent in what he was saying about you and quickly pointed out this was your last race and was rather hoping you got to Roubaix. So, uh, you got Look at that. What do you think I'm saying stars. there? You see me <laughs> <laughs> saying, G'day, mate. How are you? Yeah, nice one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, move there, buddy. What you well, actually saying was your two bottles, mate, are behind you. Don't forget to put them back on the bike. Yeah. I was like, are you okay, mate? I'll just hang here with you and help you back onto the bike. So, <laughs> so what did happen, Mitch? Tell us. Tell us the story. What happened? Look, I'm not going to say it's entirely the B&B hotel guy's fault. He, The Peloton just, you know, started. It's fast. It's wet. And everyone just locked up because there was a slowing in the bunch or who knows what it was. And as that ricochets back, everyone goes from breaking hard to even harder to locking up to eventually towards the back, someone goes down. And um, I can't remember this guy's name, but he went down right in front of me. But I think I was just, I know it. I was very, very nervous. I was very stressed about the race. And being that it was only the first kilometer into it, I hadn't even had a chance to get into the race yet. So as soon as I heard those brakes, as soon as I saw that guy fall in front of me, I also grabbed the brakes way harder than I should have. And ultimately, I just, the front wheel of mine just went down too. Um, so it was partly my fault too. Um, <laughs> I probably could, when I think about it in hindsight, if I was a more relaxed myself, I'm sure I would have just rolled around that and just rolled on with the day. But um, it just sort of shows me how much it was built up. And yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know if, thing, if things would have changed much for me from that crash. It didn't alter me too much. Um, it was just uh, what it was. What it was supposed to be, I guess. You know. How were you meant? To, I was going to say, how were you mentally after that crash? Were you? Was the adrenaline kicking in? Were you dirty on yourself? Were you able to just sort of calm yourself down down after it? I was. Yeah, I wasn't. I was actually very scared, I have to admit. I've been quite nervous in the last few races. And if I go back to the Euro Metropole Tour, which was the race on the Wednesday before, essentially a trial race for me to see how my arm was coming back, I was really scared in the race. Um, And I've progressively been getting a lot more nervous the last 
let's say the last six months, at least the last year, um, about stuff that just generally happens. I, I do believe the Peloton has changed a bit from when I first started, but also I've changed too. And things that I say now is like, I don't want to take these risks and I don't, you know, want to put myself in those situations. Those situations were there before, but I didn't see them as risks when I was younger. And the younger guys don't see them as risks either because they just do what they need to do. Whereas I'm actually assessing that situation and going, ah, and essentially I'm forcing going against the grain, doing this stuff. I know where I need to be from my experience. I know how to do it, but I, I also can see the risk in doing that or what I try and do. And I, I actually end up doing it the hard way. So when I go back to Metropole, that was a really tough race for me because it was a stressful race. It was a dangerous race. But actually, when I got through that race unscathed, I thought, okay, great. I've got the, you know, the monster off my back. I think I'm ready to go on to Roubaix. I'm, I'm, I'm clear mind now. I got through that. I'm not feeling too worried about the race. But as soon as I started the race again, I did see these things and I did feel stressed. I did feel nervous about that first sector. Um, I guess it's just the point that I'm in in my life. And I spoke to TJ Van Garda and after the race, and I sort of explained a little bit of this stuff with him. He's just retired this year. He went through a similar situation in the Vuelta where he was going down a descent. He had to try and get back onto the peloton, which meant taking some risks on a descent. He was with a teammate. His teammate said to him, let's go. Let's, let's, let's do it. And he said, I, I just had to let him go. And at that moment there, he said, you know when you know. And he said those exact words to me. And it was mm. sort of that for me. I was like, I knew then, I knew what to do if to be in that first sector. You had to take everything. You had to be there. And you also had to do it without thinking about risks. You had to just naturally want to be there and, and move through the peloton in a sort of flowing way. I felt like I was going against the current the last sort of few races. Um, so I guess to come back on all that, to the crash, you know when you know and I enjoyed the experience, but I also knew that it's time for me to to sort of move away. If he, I was just going to say, uh, uh, you know, we, we're all watching before the start and it's raining. What were your thoughts uh, just as the race was going to start and you realised, you know, it was going to be as bad as what everyone was saying? I was trying to get excited about it. I was watching 2001, 2002, and they were – they were epic editions of Roubaix um, and actually watching it, even as a cyclist who knows how hard and rough and slippery those stones can be, even watching it, I couldn't see it. You're like, Oh, it actually, it doesn't look too bad really. <laughs> um, you know, I'm like, God, how am I, how naive am I, you know, and going there, I know everyone, this is what I've heard because ultimately when we hit that first sector, I really did back off. I really just took my time and I didn't get to experience it at the front of the peloton or in the middle of the peloton. I was towards the back already. So I was taking a real safe approach. Um, but apparently in the peloton, everyone did that. I think everyone was fearing it just as much as me and the person next to me. Everyone was sort of in a weird way looking after themselves because it had been built up so much. There was this talk going around that, when normally when we come to the first sector, it's like a bunch sprint and you hit that first sector and there's guys doing lead outs and then the race sort of explodes from there. And everyone thought that that was going to happen into a wet first sector, a pretty muddy first sector. And we thought the third or fourth guy on that sector was going to drop it. It was going to be a mass pile up. Guys are going to break legs and all this sort of stuff. This was this talk around it. So can you imagine even the guys who, like mm. I said, weren't, thinking about risks and weren't too feared normally, they were starting to get nervous. So you can imagine how the older guys are feeling. Um, so the whole peloton, I think, actually took a bit of a um, caution approach to those first few sectors. And then yeah. the race split up and guys found their groove and realised, you know what, these cobbles are rideable. you just got to ride them slightly different. Mm. That came over in television, actually. Uh, and I commentated, as I say, with Bob Rowe, and I commented on the fact <clears throat> that the peloton was frightened. Mm. It was clearly obvious that the peloton was scared to death and they were treating those cobblestones with the utmost respect, especially early on. Uh, normally, they'd have gone crashing onto those cobblestones. It would have been carnage that those that got up continued the bunch, etc. But they were clearly showing the utmost respect and there was a lot of frightened bike riders, for sure. It's a great race, though. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Mitch, so I, I saw on the result sheet, obviously there were so many guys that didn't make the time cut. Were you able to finish in Roubaix or did you have to step off? No, once I um, once I came off, I was actually out the back pretty early, I think after the first sector even, and I was out there with a the group. Um, you know, you guys know Sam Bewley. He was with me too and Bewley's had a bit of an arm injury too. And I said, what do you think, Bewley? We're going to go all the way. He's like, yeah, man, this is awesome. This is epic. And he turned my mind around. I'm like, you know what? I think it's, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's push on. You know, lo, lo and behold, Bill's pulled out a couple of seconds, sectors later, the bugger. You know, there was my, <laughs> you can't my, trust um, him. my, my <laughs> man going to the end with me. And, and that group pretty much dissipated pretty quickly, which didn't normally bother me about going to the end on my own. But um, I also had some time to think out there and I thought, sort of thought Arenberg was about 60K after the first sector. Arenberg was pretty important to me because, you know, I'd had a big crash there a few years ago. My fan club had actually painted my name, the whole lead into Arenberg. And I feel like I'd sort of left them short a few races this year with all their support. And I set myself, you know what, just, just focus on Arenberg first. Don't worry about the finish yet. Let's just get, I was on my own at that point. Um, let's just get to Arenberg and let's just see what happens. You know, that was, that was sort of 50 K later and that was a pretty hard struggle to get there. Um, and when I came into Arenberg, it was, it was awesome. I saw my name on the road. It really inspired me for about the first, you know, 50, 100 metres of Arenberg until the, the reality of Arenberg settled in. I crossed <laughs> Arenberg and I, I really thought then, you know what, for me, being out here today was an amazing experience. Actually, getting to the race um, was, was a real challenge for me and I was really happy I could do that to start the race to be out there. But the fairy tale finish for me, was already sort of not happening, you know, to arrive in Roubaix one hour down behind the finish, the first guy. It just didn't need to happen for me. Um, I wanted to race Roubaix and be in that velodrome, middle of the pack, you know, feel that feeling of arriving there with some riders and going to my limit. I sort of realised because of my, like I said, my mental state, the way I was feeling in the bunch, that was never going to happen, plus the crash, all this stuff. So I was actually quite content with sort of stepping off the bike after Arenberg. Um, I have got a quite a funny story there because I saw some guys that I know from the UK, my fan club were there too. And I saw a, a mate of mine, Hamish, who lives in the UK. He works for Rafa. He was in the middle of Arenberg. I actually yelled out to him on Arenberg as I went across. He's like, hey, Mitch. I'm like, mate, drive me to the velodrome, you know, and I'm not even sure if he heard me. He just goes, yeah, good on you, mate. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, you know, like, so, like, I stop at the end of Arenberg thinking I'm going to have to ride back, you know, down the side, you know, to find him because I'm sure he's got a car. Because at that point, I don't know if anyone realises, one, not that anyone probably cares, but once you sort of become, like, 15, 20 minutes behind the bunch, the service teams, the guys who are looking after you from your team, the swan years, they have to keep moving with the race. They wait for five minutes or so, but after that, they've got to go. They've got to go to the next sector. They've got to keep going for the guys who are actually racing. They're there to support them. So ultimately, for your way to get a lift to the finish in such a race, which is point to point, gets very, you know, limited. Um, so the further I went in the race, the more limited I was to getting a ride to the end. Um, once I saw Hamish, I thought, well, you know what? he could be a good option. And in, in the end, I saw some other guys wearing my uh, podcast hat cap life in the Peloton. I spotted them at the end of the sector and I said, Hey guys, you, would you guys mind driving me to the velodrome? Um, they were fans obviously. And they sort of thought I was taking the piss. And I was like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Can I jump in the car with you? Um, and they would have loved, they would have loved that. They, they, that's what I'm talking about. Like in hindsight, it was, <laughs> It was really weird. You, you talk about the crash. I think like everything happens for a reason. The crash sort of put me in this situation. And in the end, riding in some foreign team car for an hour, going to the finish, feeling all sort of sorry about yourself. I was able to ride with these guys who were really inspired and really happy to talk about the race. And I was instantly transitioned into this great space where I could just enjoy the moment, enjoy being at Roubaix, enjoy actually doing my last race and actually – I have to admit, as soon as I stepped off the bike, I had a massive sense of relief. I was like, it's done. I'm happy. I'm happy to be out of here. I'm really feeling content. I don't need to prove anything anymore. So at that moment, jumping in the car with these guys, I had a cold beer for me, which was also another, you know, 
a great point. We sat in the car for an hour. We chatted, <laughs> and they dropped me back at the velodr- uh, at the velodrome. And I really f- sort of felt, in a weird way, really content with what had happened. Mate, you you're obviously such a good Today. podcaster, but you're yeah. such a good storyteller. I mean, that's what people love you for. Like, you're not just a <laughs> pro bike rider, but the way you can paint a picture is fantastic. We've got a few live comments. Obviously, Wendy Superfan. Hi, guys. Great to see Mitch there with you. All the best, Mitch. Ryan K says, you boys go live just as I finish the latest social distance pod. Great time. You enjoy those beers, Mitch. Uh, Jenny says, g'day. Uh, Janice says, hi, everybody. Great to see you, Mitch. Uh, Bonnie Armstrong says, Mitch, I'm glad you got to the fan club road uh, marking to get a true sense of your popularity as a pro rider. Enjoy your offie into racing retirement. Matthew says, so honest, Mitch. Good on you for being so open about your thoughts. Uh, Michael says, Mitch, I heard you on the cycling podcast say how scared you were before the race. It was scary to watch. As an ordinary club rider, it made me feel human to know that we felt the same thing. And uh, Sandy Woolley says, definitely a race worth uh, watching rather than uh, riding. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you are so popular. I I pulled – there's a photo of your fan club, off uh, your fan club's page. Mm. Uh, that was where was that at some random train station or something? By the looks no, like. that's at um, that's at the opening weekend. That's the first time I met these guys, and the way it started is the guy in the brown jacket next to me. That was his um, his bucks do. And oh, nice. That's how it happened. They went, you know what? Who's the funniest guy in the bunch? We can you know just sort of go and cheer today for his bucks, you know, and get pissed and all this sort of stuff. And that was the, you know, the one-off sort of funny bit about it. They grabbed Moe's. They thought, oh, let's just cheer on this guy. He's a bit of a, you know, mid-pack sort of guy and it'll be funny. Um, and then it caught on. They thought, you know, this is pretty fun. They're all sort of, I don't know if anyone knows really what the, the Belgian fan clubs are. They're normally just a, a bunch of sort of elderly guys who go down to a cafe, they drink beers. They're not like these guys. These are young guys with families and um, they've got, you know, working normal jobs and and these guys decide to support me and they get out there, they paint my name all over the roads. I get messages from other teammates, Belgian teammates. I remember Seth Van Mark sending me photos one time. He was out training. He sent me five or six photos. He's like, mate, your name is everywhere in Belgium. It's so <laughs> annoying. It's on all the time. Everywhere I ride, I see your name. And I'm like, how am I the guy? Like, there's really no better riders than me. How is my name for the first 50 metres of Arenberg, the biggest, most significant sector? And to go back on what you were saying, Dan, the support, I honestly was so blown away with the support I got in the, over the weekend. Just people reaching out and just saying to me, because I just didn't realise I had that much impact. Like I said, for for a mid-pack sort of rider, um, it just it really was it was beautiful. It was so it was so you know humbling. It was lovely. You, you say as soon as you got in the car to go back to the velodrome, you, you felt this relief. But what was the point, or has it not happened yet, where it has actually hit you that that's it, like the career's done? Probably the next morning, actually. Um, we got up. I went back and stayed with the uh, – my team all flew out from different places. I thought, oh, I'm just going to want to have a cleansing ale with someone. So I organised with my ex-teammate and good mate, Luke Durbridge, and good mate, Sam Bewley. We went back to the old um, bike exchange hotel where I'd stayed many times in Belgium, the Leppel bed. And we just sat up in the front room and had a you know one too many all vials that night and – the next morning I woke up and went up to that front room and I was sitting there and I just, I did have this feeling of emptiness. Mm. It sort of had set, set in. I was like, that's so strange. Like one day to the next, what what's changed? Nothing's changed. I knew all this stuff yesterday, but suddenly I had this feeling of like, wow, all right, what are you, what are you going to do now? Um, and, you know, I have got some things in the pipeline for next year. So, it did, I had this feeling of emptiness, but then straight after that, I was like, I'm really happy that I have something ready to go for next year because I could imagine what it would feel like if you hadn't have thought of that until that moment, you'd have a feeling of emptiness and you'd have a feeling of like, oh, holy shit, what am I going to do? You know, I could really feel that edge of it. And I was really happy that throughout this year, knowing I was going to retire for a long time, I was able to put some some wheels in motion that, 
you know, I, I can sort of move on to something pretty quickly um, next year and, and sort of enjoy this moment opposed to just feeling like freaked out the whole time. Phil? Yeah, it is, it is a strange feeling, but Belgium is a one-off country for sure and it's, it's the place where all cyclists should be and, and live. I, 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 only, I live there as an amateur and I just, I just got a, a fan club just... A guy in the bunch came up to me one day and said he wanted wanted me to ride on his team. Turned out he was a pretty popular amateur, destined for a good future. And I developed the fan club. And these guys were, were incredible. I remember riding a, a nocturne, one of these night criteriums, around a fur ground. It's only a kilometre lap. Going into the last lap, we hit cobbles every time on the same circuit. And, of course, they drive you to go faster because they're all getting more and more drunk. And they're shouting for more action. And I was in the winning group at the time, and there's about 10 of us left. Hit those cobblestones, had a flat tyre. Well, I was living on my prize money. I have no prizes, and I was going back home, as simple as that. And so I arrived, I threw my bike against the hedge, and the house had got changed in. I went into the house, and I came out. Under my saddle was a brand-new tubular tyre and, and some money. And that was the fan club. They just said, you're English. You need enough money for a good English breakfast tomorrow morning. <laughs> and that was what they were like. It, that's, it inspired you to do great things. And, uh, and I love Belgium, of course. I'm very much <clears throat> in love with Belgium. The World Championships this year were absolutely knockout. Biggest regret was, of course, I wasn't there. And so um, there we are. That's the first Paris Bay I've commentated on in the wet in 20 years. And they had to move it, of course, to the wrong end of the year. But, you know, the viewers on television were immense all over the world. It was seen in, by, in 180 countries. 21 countries did it live. I call them the terracotta army in the breakaway because they looked as though from the front they were, they were walking through the trenches of the old terracotta army and they were bright clay when they were drying out. Then when you got a shot from the back, they all had their clean racing jerseys on. So it was quite an amazing, <laughs> amazing, bizarre thing to commentate on at times. It really was. Well, well, take even the TV moto spinned at, well, at one point there. Yeah, exactly. Talk about dedication to duty. Um, when uh, Boivin uh, dropped it, it was his fault because we cut to it and we thought that the TV man had collided. No such thing. The TV man took a dive on the motorbike, the pilot did, uh, because they would have hit Boivin. And, in fact, he never stopped rolling the camera. So we got the whole thing on camera going down. He was still rolling it on the camera when they were all lying on the road. Now, that's dedicated <laughs> to duty. Uh, and it also cleared of any immediate accusations that TV had caused the problem because he certainly did not. But it was, a, it was a bizarre race. It was wonderful. Same must be said about the women. There, were, there was apparently transmission problems. I couldn't find the women's race until about 30K to go. Uh, and I finally got it on um, NOS television from uh, from the Netherlands. And, uh, of course, the, the, the Diagnan had been in the lead for the last 82 kilometres, so she was always in our camera. That was a ride and a half. It really was. That was a great great weekend for cyclists. Great weekend. So, Mitch, when you went to the finish line uh, at the velodrome, did you get to go inside or you just went to the team bus? What, what did you do after the after the race? I went to the team bus um, because I was then before the finish uh, and the bus driver took out the high pressure hose and hosed me down, actually, um, which wasn't that pleasurable experience, um, but necessary because we had that much mud on us that it would have clogged up the whole bus showers and um, I, the, rest of the, the rest of the riders also got the same treatment. Yeah, that we we saw that with Sarah Roy, and then um, talking to Bills and and the crew yesterday, um, they said the same thing. You, you literally couldn't go on the bus to get uh, a shower because, yeah, as you said, it would have just clogged it up. But uh, what, what what were your thoughts? Obviously, uh, Sonny Calbrelli. I think you tipped him, Phil, prior to I did. Bay. He had to. He let me down at the worlds because I tipped him for the worlds. I, I said my heart wanted Alan Philippe to win, but I thought Calbrelli would win but this time um it just shows you though the emotional pressure these guys are under that was it, it, you know the situation here with him screaming and crying and his mixed emotions he just won Paris Bay at the first attempt and crowned the, his, the best win of his career um and ha having had the best season of his career as well 
uh, everything was released there on the grass in the Rubé Velodrome. It was uncontrollable. Um, but I bet they had a good night after that. Well, I'll tell you someone who had a sensational ride and would probably give us insights to the celebrations that night is uh, Heinrich Hauser, who joins us oh, live. Heino, yo. welcome back to the detail. How you going, guys? How you going? <laughs> Hello, Heinrich. You, you had a great ride, mate. Absolutely superb ride. You were yes, on guys. it. Yeah. No, amazing day. Well, I won't <laughs> mate, how, how were the celebrations? Oh, mate, look at me. I'm still, I think I'm still hungover. <laughs> <laughs> did you get hosed down as well at the finish, Heinrich, or did you get in the showers? No, we stayed. We just stayed around. We uh, enjoyed the celebration, the podium. Just all hung around in the bus, waiting for Sonny to come back. And um, yeah, then we had a shower on the bus and uh, went back to the. We did. We all. We all were going to go home, either drive home or fly home. But we all decided to stay in Brussels and uh, go out for dinner and celebrate a bit. So. Fabulous. Hey, great why night. not? You deserved it. Um, there was great, great vision, uh, I know, of you, uh, uh, you know, grabbing uh, Cobrelli as you got to the line. It seemed to be a, a wonderful celebration together. You're obviously good mates. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, the team this year, for some reason, I don't know, it's just grown so much. We've come together. It, we just have this, like, kind of team atmosphere, spirit, brotherly kind of atmosphere it's really hard to explain it's just been from the beginning of the year it's been getting better and better and better and i think the way we rode in big bank even then it wasn't sure if sonny really wanted to do a uh, paris bay or even mate but um i i, like, I basically I, I was texting them like after big bank i said guys come on look this is this is a massive opportunity you need you guys need to do paris bay and um yeah so just it, it i, I, I still I can't, I still, I still don't have words for it because I mean, normally Paris Bay, you kind of do need years underneath your belt. You need the experience and Sonny going in there, absolutely not knowing nothing or what to expect, um, pulled off probably one of the hardest Paris Bay in history. So it's just, I just, I'm, I'm still, I still think he doesn't know what he's, what, what he's done or what he's achieved. So I, yeah, I, I still, I got no words. It's just unbelievable. Mate, we've got uh, plenty more to unpack. Phil, you've got to go to a meeting up north. We're going to take a really yep. quick drinks break, and then we're going to unpack more Brew Bay uh, after the break. Uh, how are you traveling, Mitch? You got to go anywhere, or I mean, yeah, what, what, whatever you need. Yeah, I, I okay, mind if you can ask and hino a few things too. All right, okay. mate. Yeah, yeah, hang around. Guys, that'd be great. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I'm sorry I've got to rush off today, but I've got a big meeting, and it's an hour's drive at least. Um, Cashy. Heinrich, fantastic ride, mate. You've had a great season. And Mitch, you're one of us now, but I hope to see you again soon, man. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Good on you, Phil. See you, Phil. Be easy, mate. Well, see you, mate. All right, we're gonna take we're gonna take really quick drinks, mate. When we come back, we're gonna unpack Borbury Bay. Uh, stay tuned. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at this guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs, semi-amateurs, and pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace, with over 500,000 products and 900 brands, where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns, and rides. Life is like a two-way street. It's about consideration and mutual respect. Roads are much the same. However you get around, walk, ride or drive, if we share our roads, we can all be safer. The Amy Gillett Foundation is Australia's peak cycling safety charity. Our mission is for safe cycling in Australia. Our vision is for zero cyclist deaths. Over the last year, we've seen an enormous increase in people taking up cycling, 
whether it be for recreation, with the family, commuting or even to start your own cycling career. We need to do more to make it safer for every cyclist. 20 cyclists every day are hospitalised and one cyclist is killed every 10 days on Australian roads. So, the next time you jump on your bike or hop in your car, remember to practice the four C's. Be courteous, calm, considerate and conscientious. Every cyclist's death is preventable and we all deserve to get home safely. Please donate to help the Amy Gillett Foundation make the road safer for you and for me. Thanks again to Bike Exchange and uh, the Amy Gillett Foundation. Now, Mitch, you are the master podcaster. Everyone's obviously listening to Life in the Peloton. Mate, the floor is yours. What, what do you want to pump into your old mate Heinrich Hausler? Well, I actually just wanted to ask him a little bit about Marcel Zeberg because Zeby was going through it's a very similar thing to me. It was his last race. Um, and, you know, I spoke to Zeby at the very, very well known rider in the Peloton, um, especially by the other pros. I don't know how well he is known in Australia, but um, he's a very much respected rider, especially for me. I look up to him quite a lot as he does a similar role to me, but probably a lot better. Um, and anyway, I was speaking to him in Bing Bank and he said, hey, Mitchie, you're going to finish at Roubaix? I said, yeah, um, it'd be great. Uh, let's, <coughs> let's, you know, let's get to the velodrome, all this sort of talk. But actually, I did see him, see him down the back near me coming into that first sector. But as things happened, I didn't see what happened. And I was just wondering if Hino knew how his day was, how he ended up and how he was feeling after finishing at Roubaix. Yeah. Um, first off, yeah, CB's going to be dramatically missed next year there's not really anyone that can replace him just just because of his positioning in the peloton is his 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 knowledge of reading a race a race tactics everything you know so he's he's been a very very important role in the team uh, in the last couple of years with uh, sprints and classics and um yeah it's just his uh, his knowledge is just unbelievable you know he's always sacrificed himself completely for the team never ever thought of himself or tried to do anything for himself so that's a, it's also hard to find a rider like that these days that really uh, you know does absolutely everything for the team and he's going to be a big loss for next year um yeah and the conditions on sunday didn't really make it any easier to try and finish the race you know that was i think that was one of his main big goals to finish the race finish his last race especially uh pay Bay. but i mean the conditions were just absolutely terrible and if you weren't in that first part of the race after those first few sections you know there wasn't really any chance of uh, finishing the race but um yeah he i mean he had, a, he had a good day we all had a good day because sony won you know he said he was in the bus he had tears in his eyes and uh, for him i think it was also for him it was also a win so mm. it, i mean it's also he didn't finish the race which he was a little bit upset about but i mean we we won as a team, so it's also a good. I think also that was his first monument as a win. I think all the other teams before. Wow, uh, he's never been in a team that's won a monument, so it was also also a good way to go out. Have you spoken to him since? Um, you know, just going through this process myself, and have you spoken to him since? You know, the day after, or you know, in the last couple of days, how he how he's going, and if he's feeling a sense of relief, or you know, like a bit of anxiety or emptiness i don't know like what was he what was the feeling you got from marcel because you know he had a, a bit longer career than i and um yeah i'll just be interested to hear what how he's going actually i probably should just contact him <laughs> yeah oh, um, uh, i really don't know what what, what, what what riders go through when they're about to stop or when they know they're going to stop you know um actually to be honest i don't even want to think about it because well, wait a kind sec. I'm going to interrupt you there <laughs> because you messaged me. I always remember this. When you got injured, was it two years ago now? And you said to me, I I can't remember exactly what you said, but you were like, something like, I really got to realize how good the job was and I got a little insight to that. It could be over. Um, and this, this feeling like I don't want to lose that and you push so hard to come back and you're back at the top now. So I guess you sort of did get a little inkling of, well, I don't want to retire yet. And that's what it feels like to stop when you don't want to stop. So I guess you sort of have somewhat of a feeling. Am I oh, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I did have those injuries, it was pretty, it was really 
yeah, it was touch and go. Either, you know, keep on going or stopping. But no, just because of the knee problems I had, running from doctors to different doctors, not knowing what it was, it was just... Uh, uh, and I wasn't be, I wasn't able to ride any longer than one or two hours without pain. So it was getting to a stage where it's like, yeah, okay, maybe it's gonna, I'm gonna have to stop. And um, yeah, and that's that, that that definitely did change something in my mind. And uh, now I definitely do not see this sport as a job. For me, it's more of a hobby and just something I love to do. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I, I just said before, like, oh yeah, when I think about it now, it kind of makes me scared, even though the point is gonna come. But um, yeah, I just I just love I love riding my bike. I just can't help myself. And the thing is, when I go out training, for sure, my trainer every day he's like, I know you need to settle down. Like just you know, you need to go easy sometimes. You can't just go out every day and smash yourself. But when I was injured for pretty much one and a half years, you know, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't I couldn't go out and do more than two hundred watts. And like now it's kind of like yeah, I can do that. And I just I love that feeling. And I don't I. I you know, I don't want to have that feeling again what I had a couple of years ago. So that's why I just, I don't know, I just absolutely love riding my bike. And I think when you get to an age like around about 36, 37, 38, if you're still that motivated and still really love the sport that much, it also, it, it does help, you know, racing in the peloton. Like I love the classics in the sprint, you know, fighting out with those little snippers and fighting for position, elbow on elbow, <laughs> running, driving into the corners and stuff like that. That's something I really I still love and just motivates me to, to get out there and just show them, you know, that, you know, just because I'm old doesn't mean I can't race. Mm. So, and I think that, you know, a lot of a lot of us, we get to that point in our, our career, you know, we have families and stuff and, you know, there's bad crashes. And I think it was also a little bit the same with CB. It's like, yeah, is, you know, got to take the kids to school every morning. The training is getting harder and harder. The recovery process is getting shorter. You seem to not be able to be so much more explosive and have the power like the the rest of them. So it's kind of like, yeah, you weigh up. Okay, is it worth? Is it actually worth it? You know. So mm. I haven't got to that point yet, and I think a lot of the guys, yeah, they just they they wake up maybe one day and think, yeah, maybe that that's it. You know, maybe it's time to mm. stop. It's it's interesting, like, because we, we just spoke about all that just before you came on, and so interesting to hear you more or less say exactly the same thing I said. But on the other side, exactly what I was trying to say to you guys before was there's a point where you don't see, like you said, Hino, I love it. I love racing. I love fighting into the corner for trying to beat these guys in and opposed to me going, I know what I need to do, but I don't love it, and I'm going to try and do that because I know that's what I should do. And you can see the difference there, how easy it is when you love to do that and you love the challenge of it. So it's great that you are able to say that, actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, for sure, that makes a massive difference, and especially on, on Sunday in those conditions, you know. Just mm. switching on for six hours, being concentrated and fighting for every single bit of tarmac or every little single position because you know anything can happen if you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time. You know that's race over. So it does. It does. It's 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 not easy. It's it, I mean it's bloody hard. Hmm. But once oh, you get to the velodrome, it's uh, it's worth it. Now, if you, I got to I got to admit to one thing. Uh, I know we were debating uh, before the event. we were predicting, and uh, someone threw your name into the into the mix, and I, I said did. something like, <laughs> "Yeah," and I said, "Look, I think Heinrich." You know, I always felt you were someone who could win uh, Paro Bay at Tour of Flanders. They were your type of events going back before you got injured. And I just said, might be a bit past it now. So I dig. But I'll tell you what, I was so impressed, mate. You looked brilliant all day. And especially in that last 40, 50K when the pressure was really on, you never looked in danger in that bunch. So just take us through it. I mean, especially the last... Uh, you know, say 50 or 60K of that race when it was all starting to splinter apart. Yeah, well, I mean, look, Pay Bay, I think, is uh, the best race most suited to my style of racing, or at least now when I'm older. Um, it's just a race that also motivates me so much to get ready for. And um, I had a big break during the summer. I was, like, you know, completely off the bike. Didn't race for a long time. Went up to altitude just because of knowing that Pay Bay was going to be in October. So I thought it was, you know, it was a good chance to do a good result. 
And, um, you know, obviously our, our, our equipment with our bikes, with the Merida bikes, Vision Wheels and the Conti Tubeless, I think we, we had the best uh, equipment possible out there. Steady on. And also, oh, no, it's, it, is, it is. I mean, especially with the, with the Tubeless, it's, we had a slight advantage. Conti, the mate, teams. they're way behind now. Victoria Tubeless, that's where you want to be. Ah. <laughs> when two tribes go to war. <laughs> this is great. Anyway, as you were. No, and it's also it's been also with the tubers, and uh, it's just been a process over the last two years. Paris Roubaix didn't happen the last one and a half years, or two, the last two editions uh, got cancelled. So um, we haven't been able to use those, those tubeless tyres the way we wanted to. And um, so yeah, it just it worked out everything perfectly. We had guys in the front working like CB, you know, putting us up there in that first section. Jonathan Milan also, um, even you know that's. Also- Another thing with CB, even though it's his last race, it's like, you know, he was all out for the first 90K. It's just, you know, putting himself out there for the team, knowing, okay, if I'm going to, you know, blow my, blow my, my socks off, you know, I'm probably going to make it to the velodrome. So that's also hats off to him to do that. And um, then we had two guys in the front group. 30 guys went up the road pretty early, which was, I was like kind of a little scared, you know. I was like, oh, well, Sonny's with me. Matei's with me. I mean, we, yeah, we did have two guys up there, but they weren't really our two captains. And I was a bit worried that uh, it was going to go all the way to the finish because it wasn't really that much, uh, like, uh, teams really pulling in the back of the peloton and the gap did go out to two minutes and they went out up to, like, two and a half minutes. And I was like, oh, these guys are gone, you know, especially once we hit that first section, there's probably going to be a massive crash and then it's race over. But, you know, it was pretty much like an elimination race. Uh, section for section, you know, there, there were the crashes, guys a job guys had flat tires or whatever and then pretty much uh, the section before Arenberg was the first decisive move i think there was like about 12 13 guys that uh went clear of the peloton with all the favorites you know like uh yeah from the pool fun art and all the rest of them and um then after Arenberg, sonny i don't know what happened but he all of a sudden just decided to attack and uh yeah basically it went from then um they went off the front um we could just sit on the back you know i was with uh first mathieu was also in our group he rode off by himself rode across which was also very impressive and then the last for me for example the last 50 k's i mean for me it was just it was basically just a free ride to the velodrome because um, uh, having Sonny in the front, uh, I didn't really have to do nothing. Just sit on and maybe just you know go through the odd time to the front and just slow 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 the the, the speed down or break in the corner just to piss everyone off. And um, <laughs> yeah, just it's, uh, also I mean everything just was you know we had car number three which also made things. Uh, so much more easy because at one stage I did have to change bikes and having the car directly there, you know, it was only a matter of 15, 20 seconds. If we would have had car number 20, the race would have been over. So, you know, it was, it, made our life. it just went perfect on the day. And that also has to happen. But you need to have luck on the day. I mean, you make, you also make your own luck, luck, but um, everything just went, went perfectly. It was just, uh, unreal you know and then i because with the the groups were so close together i could hear the the directors you know speaking to sonny and telling him what to do and then we entered into the dollar room we got the bell left to go and then all i could hear was just the screaming in the radio and everyone was just like going off chops and it's just like straight away it's like i knew sonny won went to the finish seen him like actually just you know enjoying or whatever he was going through and just also me you know started i just you know i just started having tears in my eyes just because it's like for me it was also like almost like winning that one myself it was uh it was i don't know i just had no words it was unreal i just blown away it's such it's such a hard race it's 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 the hardest race on on the calendar and it just uh it, it, you you push yourself that much to the limit which uh, I think in other races is just almost impossible. Mm. Mm. Mate, you're talking about the team and, and, you know, obviously you guys are up and about. It's been such an amazing year, but 
the the progression of the team, we, we spoke to you earlier in the year and we're talking about, you know, Neil Stevens coming along and it, it really felt like the culture is starting to change. And and what I want to know is, is how much of that is built on the word trust? Because when things are working, people start trusting the process. You trust the riders, you trust the staff, you trust the equipment. Is it a real momentum thing? Oh, yeah, for sure, 100%. I mean, it started out just in a small... Your races in France where, you know, maybe Phil would get a win, uh, then, uh, you know, Jack Haig would get a top five on the GC. And then it just, you know, they, they, that just jumps off of, the, of the, you know, you have another team racing in Italy. They'll see that, that motivates them. And it just, they just, you know, that, that motivation, that, 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 yeah, that, that trust or that, you know, going to the, actually going to the races to say, okay, we're here to win. We're not here on the start line just to fill up the numbers. But, we, you know, we're actually here with a plan. You know, all teams want to win. You know, it, it was the same in Paris Bay. Of course, we wanted that. To, everyone team wants to win Paris Bay. But we actually, it might sound weird, but, you know, we believed in our riders. We believed that we were going to win. So mm. it's, uh, yeah, it's just been building up slowly, step by step over the year. And, and, and you know, even then the smaller riders that, you know, maybe they're not that strong, but they, they start to build that much confidence. And um, yeah, just it, it got it really got more and more race by race, by race. and uh, after Big Bank, where we just had you know massive success and rode amazingly together with the team, where we're like, come on, we we're going to go to Paris Bay and try and win it. So mm. I hope you know it's, it's also this has been something I experienced. I've been searching for for the last you know 10, 12 years. What I experienced with Sabello, just that that brotherly whatever relationship where you know you're at the dinner table you guys are sticking together you're laughing even after the the dinner you know you go to one room and you just hang out you you see them when you come to the airport you just you're just happy you know it's just um something i've been searching for for the last 10 or the last decade and um to to experience that feeling again within the team before i stop is also for me it's also something special i hope and continue next year you know it's kind of strange we're all going to go into uh, kind of like our breaks we won't see each other until maybe january and just you know there'll be new 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 people coming into team new riders and also riders leaving the team for example like cb which is also you know he's been also an important role with that so i hope this this is a team or this relationship or this team spirit can just keep on going for another one or two years mate the rate you're going you're going to run uh, uh, <laughs> no, sure can. <laughs> <laughs> two riders i wanted to ask you about uh i know because you uh, were up and uh, close is that uh, one the young uh, Florian was it Florian uh, Vermeer who finished second I mean only 22 very very impressive and of course uh, Gianni Moscon uh, you know without his dramas it's debate would he have held them off I, I don't know I just want to talk about those two guys yeah well I mean Gianni he's a, he's a strong rider he's been known already beforehand you know especially one day races for for his power and strength and uh he's also done a few good results in the past so i mean um it was no surprise really that uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise in paris bay being up there um florian yeah i know florian pretty well because i've done a big long training camp in uh, altitude during the summer and he was also in the same hotel so um, I've seen a lot of him this year and also because he's that kind of classic style races and he'd be, uh, you know, doing lead outs and putting his guys into position. So he's definitely uh, a young and up and coming talent. I did have a big run in with him at, during the classics. I didn't even know who he was. He, and uh, straight away after I Googled him or looked on pro cycling stats and I was like, yeah, okay, no, he's all right. He's a classics guy. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for him also, it's 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 a massive thing, you know, to get second at Paris Bay at such a young age. It's um, he's, if you can show that kind of class, especially on that Paris Bay at that young age, it's uh, he's definitely got a big future in front of him. He was a so, very good cyclocross cross as a as a junior. He was one of the best in Belgium, evidently in cyclocross, which obviously helped him out uh, on Sunday. 
Well, that's what oh, people yeah, are asking I'm... live. They want to know. I know you plan on doing more cyclocross races in the off season. What were your thoughts after the cyclocross worlds? That's from David. Oh yeah, my my season starts now. Um, already on Tuesday, I started doing a uh, technical training, went out ten k run. I'll have my first race next week, and then it's just every weekend. It's either a, a World Cup or a double weekend where there's two races, and that they'll pretty much go all the way through until January and of January, just depending on team training camps and stuff. But um. Like I said, I'm not getting any younger and I want to get absolutely everything out of my body. No regrets when I stop. And that's why I really do think um, you benefit from cyclocross. It's just um, also I'm not 100% sure I benef- benefited from it on Sunday, just the bike handling skills. And if you've seen uh, the amount of guys that were up there, you know, that did cyclocross in the past or are still doing it, it's, it's quite a quite, quite amount quite a lot of them and um yeah it's just i i, I really I, lo- I love it and i think it does benefit and that's why i'm going to do it i mean it's, it's all hard you know, like straight away now everyone's going into uh, their breaks and they're going off to spain or whatever doing their holidays and just uh keep on going and then it's, also it's like it's a lot of stress it's just pure stress stress especially if you have a family at home you're just always you know traveling you're always way at home you, know, you have to have a good support behind you and a wife that really understands what you're doing. So yeah, I'm going to be gone doing a, a full season this year. Got a proper setup, got all my bikes ready. Uh, I'll have help from Marita and from the team. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, after last year, the few days that I've done, I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to, I, I mean, I, I know I've got absolutely no chance whatsoever, but the whole idea of it behind it is, you know, to try and get a little bit more faster, a little bit more power for, for, for next year, for next year for the classics. Mitch, were you ever tempted to do that? I love the idea of it. Um, I really love the idea of it. And maybe I was a bit like Hino where I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll get up there and try it. But I never went that far. And seeing and speaking with Hino um, made me realise, you know, Hino's a much better classics rider than I am. And to see him... And I respectfully say this, and Heiner knows what I'm talking about, get his ass absolutely kicked up there, means that I would not even barely get a lap around there. Because the stuff you see on TV, and it goes back to Roubaix, you're watching, like I said, I watched 2001, 2002 wet Roubaix, and I'm like, it actually doesn't look bad at all. Same thing happens when you watch cyclocross. You're like, oh, I could get around that. But some of the stuff they're doing is so technical, so hard, because you're watching it on TV, you think it's okay let alone the speed of it and the accelerations and all this stuff. And Hino holds his own there. He's pretty respectful out there. But comparison to those, uh, the the guys who do it professionally for their whole, you know, their, their living and Van der Poel and Van Aan and these guys, it's, it's a big gap. So I would love to see Hino be somewhere closer up on the grid this year because I think that does help a lot too, the starting grid that is. And hopefully he can work his way up a little bit and have a, a bit more of a chance to sort of hang in the front for a little while. What do you think, Hino? Have I overstepped my comments there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably think so. <laughs> no, it's just that, yeah, you can't. They're technically that, that good and uh, that strong. Just like, for example, there's one like, if, even if I had my finish line after like five or six minutes, you know, they, they, they'd still, and even though they had to do one hour of racing, they would still be that that much far in front of me it's not funny mm. but it's ba- it really comes down to more it's more the the technical part you know you really have to it's it's also hard to train technique when you're 37 you know it's like i've got two kids now they're six years old and already now we're starting with them they're just absolutely crazy you know one one thinks they're mature and the other one thinks they're wild it's so funny to see when we're out on in the you know on the playground or on the street they're like you know, they're commentating themselves so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's dropped it's, it's, off line, John. Yeah, phone went flat. <laughs> I had to go back to Wi Fi. <laughs> okay, right. sorry, mate. Sorry, Hino. All good. Yeah. <laughs> no, all good. Yeah, it's just something I'd like to, yeah, definitely. Um, for example, the World Cups last year, I, I wouldn't even have a chance to finish them. It'd be, it'd be nice if I could get to some kind of level where I could actually finish a World Cup, and then I'd be absolutely satisfied with that. 
Got a couple more comments. Uh, Janice says, fabulous listening to Mitch and Heinrich. All the best in your retirement, Mitch. Uh, Gay really liked it when you took the control button there, Mitch. Whose podcast is this? Love it. Go, Mitch. Uh, Paul McVilly, he says, ask Hino about coffee and plug my bloody coffee podcast. Worth a shot. He's coming on the show Monday. You're a big coffee man, aren't you, Hino? Yeah. Uh, you, you texted me this morning. I was like, oh, yeah, first give me give me, give me uh, about 20 minutes. I have to have like three coffees to wake up. So, yeah, it's another, I've only probably got three hobbies in my life, and that's uh, my kids, um, coffee, and cycling. So, it's, uh, I think definitely coffee, when I want to stop cycling, is also it's just going to be a part of my, my life, and I'd like to do something in that kind of area when I stop. So, definitely. You're a big coffee um, man, Mitch. I remember you going to races with your manual grinder and yeah, you, know, you do the straining and you had a whole system there. Uh, yeah, I think we're, we we all love good coffee. That's what it comes down to, um, you know, and having a good machine at home. And I just realized in Spain that I'm just going to go home and have a coffee or have a coffee before I go. Um, so that was, the, that was the process there. And then on the races, it was the same thing. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to control this and just get my own coffee and... At the end of the day, we all love a good cup of coffee. So I think that's what Hino's talking about too. He's pretty good on the latte art. I've been watching him lately. I was seeing his uh his um Instagram and getting a good pour there, mate. I like I like that grinder you've got too. It's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, so, uh, coffee and cycling they get together. I think almost every all all cyclists, you know, they they drink good quality and or they want to drink good coffee. And um yeah, I, I, I I'd say I don't know. There's so more than half of the peloton they they all have the, their own coffee machines at home, and it's just something that belongs together. I don't know. Even when you go out training, just you know, you meet up either at the coffee store or you you stop at the coffee store, and um, it just yeah, it just those two two things they just belong together. So it's uh, it's also you know it's um, like people have interest for cars or whatever. You know, for me, it's uh, I'm just driving a small, small little car that gets me to A to B. Some people like to have big fancy cars, whatever, a Ferrari or whatever. And that's the, with me, it's the, the coffee machine and the grinders. You know, I like to, to yeah, for me, it's a hobby and I just uh, like spending time on the machine. Well, that would bloody save you some dollars, subbing a Lambo for a, a rocket coffee machine. Sure. <laughs> now, there is a, I've got a, a, a Degani uh, here, coffee, but actually it looks like a coffee. It's black. But it's actually uh, got a bit of this in it. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Uh, last one from the punters. Uh, Tom Maloney says, an Aussie op opinion was posted this week. The Paribu Bay may have trouble from the point of view of damage and injury insurance costs. What do you think? What do you guys think about that? Uh, it's probably not something you'd be worried about, would you? That's all back-end logistics. <laughs> I, actually think, I actually think it was... Um, nowhere near as dangerous as I anticipated or anyone anticipated. You know, I thought there was going to be crashes all over the place. But, you know, coming out of it from the stuff that I've heard and speaking to guys, there wasn't a lot of people that came out drastically injured or a million people crashing. But I could be wrong. Hino, what do you think? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I, to be honest, I also thought, you know, we're going to hit that first section and there's going to be 80 guys uh, on the ground. But I also didn't really hear anything of people, you know, crashing really bad or anyone ending up in hospital with broken right. bones or anything, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I didn't really hear anything. But, I mean, all, yeah, it, it should, it's Perry Rebay is also in, in, in high conditions. It's just, it's it's, uh, it's uh, that dangerous and that bad. But, Maybe because the, the conditions were that bad, you know, obviously a lot of the times we also didn't hit cobblestones as fast or in a massive group. So I think that may have also turned down the dangerousness mm. of the race. And plus, already, I mean, I, I only can speak for myself, you know, already after 120K, I was that, that stuffed and that cooked that, you know, just also, I, you kind of sometimes just stay in your position where you are. You know how strong you are, and you won't fight in that bad position. So that, that I think that made a made it definitely not as dangerous as it would have been. You know, normally you have like 120, 130 guys coming into Arnberg with 70k an hour, and pretty much just cleaning your eyes once you hit that first section because you're fighting a position. 
but this year that just wasn't the case. If we, we could talk to these guys for hours about obviously Rube Bay, but I've got a couple of clips I've got to play uh, with Buell, Sturbo and Heyman. Anything you want to add before we let them go, Johnny? No, look, uh, uh, Buell, uh, uh, um, first of all, Heinrich, you, what are you doing this summer? Are you going to get back to Oz or you'll be staying in Europe, you think? Um, no, I mean, it'll, no, I'll probably just be staying here because of, um, yeah. just the, the, this, the, yeah, it's just not really that much time to come back, uh, especially during cross season. Yeah. Uh, kids just started school also here. So, um, haven't really got holidays to, 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 to go back to Oz. Plus with the Corona restrictions, it's also not, not that easy to travel international at the moment. And, um, yeah. Just maybe, yeah, and like I said, I mean, because of the corona restrictions, my parents have been able to come over this year, but normally my parents come over to to Germany every every year, so I see them. So I'm going to have to get back at one stage, that's for sure. I haven't been back to Oz for a very long time. So, um, but unfortunately, not this winter. Mm. And when what are you heading back, Mitch? Mitch? Yeah. I'm heading back uh, in about three and a half weeks, start of November. That's the plan, but... um. I'm hoping I'm hoping things open up for this home quarantine because uh, that's what we're praying on, and our flight is booked in, but we're getting sort of mucked around a little bit. So look, we got our fingers crossed that everything goes smooth because um, we're 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 not just going back for a holiday; we're relocating and got the you know shipping container and all that sort of jazz. So I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. I'll be really happy when that whole process the logistics you know it's it's, mm. it's such a such an annoying sort of process and you want that done so i'm going to be happy to be back in oz and settled in back to back to melbourne life well we've reduced the pfizer gap to three weeks now so you'll be sweet mate we'll get to the 80 percent. no dramas beautiful be, you, the restrictions 100 percent guaranteed great guaranteed mate i'm with dan <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been great having you boys on and, and some fantastic insights and uh mitch congratulations on a fantastic career on and off the bike and hino congrats on team bahrain victorious very apt name uh winning roubaix and, and a great ride yourself mate you should be really proud and we're looking forward to your uh cyclocross season kicking off thanks thanks guys thanks. see you hino. Stuff, fellas. Bye, uh, see you guys thanks. have a good one take it Bye, easy guys. Fantastic insight from the boys there. And uh, as I said at the top of the show, we've got some insights from Luke Durbridge, uh, Matt Heyman, and of course, uh, Sam Bewley. I've almost forgot Bills. Uh, this is what they had to say about uh, Roubaix on the Social Distance podcast. And a heads up, there is, if you are going to listen to the Social Distance, there is some swearing. I've bleeped it out for this. But if you do watch it raw on YouTube, maybe uh, send the kids to bed. I'm glad that Roubaix's done and dusted, particularly you, Durbo. Yeah, mate. Uh, me, it was a, it was a, it was a big, it was a big one, wasn't it? Yeah. He's Jesus. coming hot <laughs> straight off the bat. Swear jar. Um, I was just nowhere else to describe it. It was, it was pretty gnarly. Um, yeah, we, um, I didn't crash, so like I said, it's a bit of a victory in the end. And um, but yeah, it was definitely one for the ages. Uh, Twenty years since the last time it rained, so. I was about ten years old, so I definitely wasn't there for that. And um, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was it was a big weekend. So it was a, it was a hard way to finish the season. I will tell you that. Do you get worried like when you race in mud? Like I remember that famous day when I think you got really crooked. Um, was it Tour of Langkawi when it was a real muddy day and there was bacteria in the mud? Is that Bay mud? The mud that smells like cow shit, or is it's not too bad? I don't know. I think it's well, least of your worries, eh? least of your yeah. worries in Roubaix. Like, you probably could get crook from it, but, like, you know, it's like you said, there's a lot lot of uh, other things that can go wrong, probably a little bit worse than just getting a crook gut. So uh, I had a few Belgian beers after the race to sort of kill anything in there. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although the eyes, the eyes weren't looking that good. A bit of pink eye there for a while. Wasn't yeah, my, my eyes are looking a bit better now. Um, yeah, you me, yeah, no, it's all right. Um I couldn't see. My eyes were so bad. I lost my glasses on the second sector. Um, but actually, saying that, yeah, I just pulled a bit of dirt out there right now. I'm just waking up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely. Um, it was just uh, like a film, like on your eyes. It was just unbelievable. Like I, I didn't matter what you did, I just couldn't clean them. 
Yeah, you couldn't do it either way. Like, you couldn't wear glasses and you couldn't no. not wear glasses, but you had to get across the cobble somehow. Like, there's obviously some pretty epic images out there. Like, from, oh, yeah. there's one from Emil Lepins from uh, Trek. Did you see that photo? He, I think he was the last finisher within the time cut. And uh, there's a big photo expo of him on Instagram or somewhere. And, like, you can't recognize it. It's just literally like the masked man. And then you just got these little eyeballs in there that are just bloodshot red because I thought of dirt as well. It was. It was something else, eh? And like the <clears throat> when I went up there last week, I've had still had a had a you know problems with my wrist throughout the whole year, so I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to be able to do um, or how far I was going to be able to go on the cobbles. And so the plan I spoke, Maddie was there, there as our director, and we spoke on Saturday morning, and and the plan was I was just going to go as far as I possibly could, you know. And the reason I wanted to go as far as I could was because it was Roubaix for starters. Like you don't. Parry Bay is something special and it's any year, any time you go to Parry Bay, even just like the, the days leading up to it, you know, all the teams out doing recons, all the cycling journalists out there taking photos. You're in this like, <clears throat> no offense to the Northern French French people, but you're in this shitty part of France <laughs> and it's like... Yeah, no offense taken. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, fair call. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> shitty, shitty as fuck. Oh, not too bad. Oh, so move on. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but it just fe- it just feels like there's something <laughs> happening, you know, that weekend, like those days. It just feels like there's something happening. And then when we saw the weather forecast and we saw the women's race the day before, which on another note was spectacular as well, um, I was like, I have to do this wet rebate. I don't know what's wrong with me. Am I crazy or what? But I have to, I have to go out there and slip and slide and crash and land on the mud and land in a puddle. I have to do this. It's been 20 years. It might not be another. Who knows when the next one's going to be? And I, April. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, wait too long. <laughs> like it's something just like that's in your bloodstream, or and you know, I, I know that you share this this passion, Matty, or you you know, you probably multiply this passion and you too too with Dubai. But there's something about Roubaix that no matter what is happening, how you're feeling, whether you're sick, injured, tired, motivated, unmotivated, all of a sudden you get through Bay and this thing f- flicks in your heart, I think, more than your head. And you go, I've, I've got to go onto those stones. You know? Do you agree, Matty? Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit different. Flanders, we're kind of racing up there all the time. We're, we're on those roads. And then, and then, yeah, it's just pretty mythical to go through Arenberg. And, um, and, yeah, especially, I mean, I was pretty nervous the night before, knowing that it was going to be wet, nervous for you guys. And also knowing that, you know, outside of a stage of the Tour de France, no one had been on wet cobbles for 20 years and nobody had a real true sense of what it was going to be like. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, it remains pretty special for me. Were, were uh, you driving, Matty, or did you have someone else? No, nah, I had big Lorenzo driving. He was he was, uh, <laughs> he was uh, wetting a few people. But <laughs> in his defence, in his defence, the, uh, the car... You cannot drive just down the cobbles, and and you need to, uh, otherwise it bottoms out in that the ridge yeah. in the top. So we have bash plates under the car, but the car isn't isn't made any higher. We didn't have any extra suspension or anything. So you need to leave one wheel on the top of the ridge of the cobbles, and the other wheel on the side, and also to let the the lane on the left hand side open for the riders. But um, yeah, I think it was uh, Rusty came up, Gregory Rust, and. Uh, from Trek and just said you've just actually because his his right hand wheel was just always in the puddles and it was sending like just just like a, a shower of mud across and he went past this VIP area with these all these people in white pants and shirts and they would have been they would have been twenty five meters away from the course and and Rusty could not stop laughing that he said they were just covered in head to toe in manure and shit and part of the road so uh it was uh i think it by about half race he was doing it on purpose to be honest <laughs> oh he's brutal he's brutal yeah. 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 he wouldn't give a shit too like no, those no. guys would be like, oh sorry like the <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> um, yeah. i loving it there was a reason there was a reason we had to keep the car off the off from bottoming out but I also mm. think he he found a couple of big puddles. Yeah, when you go up into the grass and you you almost <laughs> <played> <laughs> <on> it, <laughs> through the barbecue seat. <laughs> Watch out! Yeah, I'm not driving on the cobbles, eh? <laughs> so, we only uh, we only had one car in the race. Well, you know, one 
one kind sports of. we discussed. Yeah, kind of. So he had Heyman as the head BS, like calling the shots, and then Lorenzo driving the car for him. And then after a while, like Derby went in the breakaway of like 30 guys went away, about 30, 30k before the first sector or 40k. I can't remember when it was exactly. But before the first sector, this group of 30 riders went away. We had Derby in there. We had Rob Stannard in there. And Derby, who was was one of our leaders, um, were our main leader for the ra- for the race. And then at, at a certain point, all the all the cars, team cars, started coming past the peloton to go and s- to drive behind the breakaway riders. They had a two minute gap at this point, and I never saw Heyman go past. And then uh, and then I could hear him on the radio, and I was like, I never saw Lorenzo and Maddie go past, but I assume that he they, they must be at Durbo now. Like no, they're in the puddle. <laughs> oh, like, that'd, be, that'd be crazy not to be servicing Durbo now in the cobble section driving behind us. Anyway, we get to the first sector. It goes into about 10,000 groups, like, straight away. Crashes, people slipping, sliding everywhere. And I'm in a group of 20 guys, 30 guys or something. And after about five or six sectors, by this point, I'm, mate, I'm not even in the same radio service as Durbo. I'm so <laughs> far behind Durbo at this point, you know. Ten minutes behind him, probably. And I come off the sector and I turn left. Till we turn left and I look to see if there's any more riders coming on the cobbles. And there's my team car there with all the bikes on the roof. And I'm like, what the f is Maddie doing? Like, he is is he backing me or what? Maybe, maybe, maybe he's backing me for you you know, a lot of back here. on the way in. And so I like turn around and I have a look back, and it was just our team physio and our, one of our team mechanics <laughs> just driving the other car just in the race. <laughs> like, hey boys. <laughs> Yeah, I had to make a call. I had to make a quick call, and uh, yeah, we're we're, we're uh, you know flexible multitaskers. Yeah, fantastic insight for the boys. Uh, they were definitely up and about on that episode of the uh, Social Distance Podcast. So you'll uh, have to check that out in its entirety oh. because Durbo Durbo tells a great story about um, uh, Bill's washing his Rubé kit and taking all the mud off it, and the numbers and his parents were filthy. They wanted to frame it, so. <laughs> yeah, check that out. And also, um, this is really important. Keep subscribing and tell your mates, youtube.com forward slash the detour podcast. It does make a difference because whenever we do a show and you turn on notifications, you'll get a, a notification to say, hey, boys are live. Uh, and we're going to have plenty of episodes through the off season, Iffy. We are, yes. We're every Thursday and occasionally an extra one when it, when it, when it warrants it. Uh, of course, you know, this weekend uh, is, is the final uh, big race for the year. The, the season winds down. So mm-hmm. we've got the Gila di Lombardi, uh, and, uh, which is always a great race and a monument. Uh, but it's, And then uh, next week we'll do a, a wrap of the whole season, the best of the detail, which I think uh, could be pretty special, actually. Yeah, no, uh, they've got a bit of work to do to cut all those clips up, but I will do it. This is very important to the fans, Johnny. They love a best of, so why not? <laughs> uh, so thanks again for all your support. Anything you want to add before we go, John? Uh, just look, it, it, it was the, the word you missed at the start an epic Perro Bay. No doubt about that. First wet run in 20 years, and just an amazing, and also the first women's uh, Perro Bay. I just got to. So I, I felt for uh, Gianni uh, Moscon, the, the Italian, who I, I believe probably would have won it. He was looking so, so strong. <clears throat> Once he had the wheel change, I just reckon that uh, that tyre had too much pressure on it because he was bouncing around the place and then just fell off. And from then on, it, it was downhill. And, of course, we were – I was texting back and forward with uh, Brett Lancaster, who was driving the car behind and. Yeah, I can imagine how excited uh, he was. He was because it looked mm. like uh, Ineos could win their first ever uh, Paris Bay, but it, it didn't happen. Uh, and I was really impressed with uh, the young Belgian who who got who got second. That was uh, you know, Florian Florian Vermeer uh, Vermesh, but he he was uh, yeah, yeah brilliant. And of course Heinrich Hausler. Wow, what mm. a ride! Yeah, mm. he shut me up big time. <laughs> And uh, speaking of Paris Roubaix, the 2007 winner, Stuart O'Grady, big couple of days for him, if he. The arrival yes, he, of, of course, he was going to be on the O'Grady. <laughs> yeah, isn't that beautiful? Uh, he was going to be on the on the show. Oh, there she is! Isn't she gorgeous, Zali? Yeah, Paris congratulations. O'Grady. Yeah, so and I said, and Stuart uh, and the family, fantastic. It's wonderful, wonderful. And I sent a text through to Stuart yesterday. Are you ready for the show tomorrow? He said, "I might be busy," <laughs> and only about an hour later. 
I knew why. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic stuff. But as we said, make sure you subscribe to the show uh, and turn on notifications uh, because we're going to be doing plenty over the off-season. Thanks for all your support. Thanks to Heinrich Hausler. Thanks to Mitch Docker. And uh, thanks to the boys on Social Distance Podcast, Luke Durbridge, Matt Heyman, and Sam Bewley. Fantastic insights. Uh, we'll be back again soon. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys.